Anyway, um, let me just go straight to the introduction. My name is Shu Ying. Uh, I'm here representing the Marine Conservation Group, uh, MCG, of the Nature Society Singapore, NSS. Okay? So NSS, Nature Society, is a non-government, non-profit organization, and we work to foster um, the awareness and appreciation of nature and to advocate the conservation of these natural spaces here in Singapore. So today and tomorrow, we have a series of young marine biology sessions. We have some experts sharing with us. Uh, and then right now at 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., the topic we're talking about is sea stars. Okay, thank you for joining us. So um, can we go back one slide, please? Okay, yes. Yeah, so, so, some other activities that NSS organizes are uh, include guided nature walks, bird watching, butterfly watching, and some other workshops as well. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So today's event is organized by Marine Conservation Group, MCG, and it's one of the many interest groups that uh, NSS has. So MCG was formed to encourage understanding and protection of marine nature in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Uh, our activities are focused on increasing awareness and limiting threats to the marine ecosystem. We also have conservation projects, including like the monitoring of endangered species. Okay, so um, before we start the session, I just want to share a few Zoom tips, okay, in, in case some people here are new to Zoom. Okay, so first of all, you will notice that everyone is muted. So you will be stay muted unless you are the panelist or you're the expert speaker today. And secondly, could you help to just turn off your videos, you know, so that we can have um, bandwidth for everyone. We don't want things to be lagging, things like that. Okay. Um, thirdly, um, later on, if you click on uh, view at the top right hand corner of your Zoom window, you can switch to the speaker view. So if you do that, then you will just focus on looking at who is the person who is speaking instead of seeing like 49 other faces. Okay, then that's very confusing. All right. And then along the way, whenever you have some questions, you can just type it into the chat. Uh, if you have questions for the scientists, you have questions for our uh, young panelists, you just type them into the chat and send them to uh, Q&A. So you can find the chat at the bottom. You go to your bottom bar, there is a chat button and you open it and you can send a direct message to uh, Q&A. Okay, send it to Q&A and then we will we'll collect the questions and then we'll answer the questions at the end of the session. All right. Um, lastly, this session will be recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel about one week later next week. Okay? All right. So now let's move into um, the interesting bits. I want to introduce to you our, our young experts today. Okay. So when I call your name, can you please just come off mute and wave and say hi? Okay. So first we have Siobhan. Siobhan, can you say hi? Hello, everyone. I'm Siobhan Lui and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Siobhan. We're very happy to have you as well. So Siobhan finds life underwater fascinating and how it's so different and unique to life on land. She's intrigued by the clownfish that lives among the anemone on the coral reefs and also octopus that could camouflage itself with its surrounding and also have the ability to squirt ink to escape from predators. So Siobhan, her favourite author is Annette Blyton. She enjoys reading, she enjoys writing stories, art and even coding. Shavon can code and design games to play with her family, and she also plays the piano and violin. Wow, great job, Shavon. Okay, next we have Enchi. Enchi, can you come up here and say hi? Hello, I am Enchi from Chi Respect Yumi Primary. I am so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Enchi. So, Enchi is an animal lover who shares a special bond with her pet hamster, Luna. She enjoys how Luna is able to respond and interact with her and how they spend time together. So NT also finds coral leaf reefs to be highly fascinating, especially with all the colours and biodiversity that can be found in the reef. She's intrigued by how they live and thrive as one community, yet they are all unique in their own special ways. NT enjoys drawing, painting and writing as well. Okay, next, say hi to Evans. Hello, I'm Evans from Amy Primary School and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Evans. So Evans is constantly fascinated by marine animals that have the ability to regenerate parts of its body, like the sea stars. So I'm sure you have a lot to share with us later. Evans uh, believes that there are more animals and, they are, and with this ability and they are yet to be discovered. 
He also finds math interesting and also enjoys singing CG5 songs. Okay. Last but not least, we have Ying Le. Ying Le, you want to say hi? Hi. Hello. Hello, Ying Le. Nice to meet you. So Ying Le loves dolphin and is fascinated by the way that they can appear to jump very high and swim as fast as a cheetah can run. He finds them cute and very interesting. And in school, he enjoys math and enjoys sol solving riddles. His favorite comics book includes Tintin, Asterix and Oblix and Doraemon. Okay, thank you, our, our very young uh, experts. I'm looking forward to hear your sharing later. And of course, I want to introduce a very important person today. He's Mr. Chua Sik Chuan. Hi, Sik Chuan. You want hi. to say hi? Okay. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I've been uh, interested in marine biology for quite a while, since I was about your age. And then um, I went and did a degree. And then I came back to Singapore and um, started to do work. I was quite heavily involved with Nature Society um, for a while. And then work interfered with all of that. Uh, but I'm back to helping with Nature Society again. And hopefully, I can meet you all on the seashore one day. Thank you, Sik Chuan. So just a bit more introduction about Sik Chuan. He found his passion in marine and coral reef conservation and began exploring the intertidal and underwater world. So he holds a master's degree in marine affairs and ecology, and he added mangroves, sea grasses, and even tropical rainforests to his interests and has been playing a behind-the-scenes role in education, awareness, and conservation in nature, especially in marine nature. So Sik Chuan has been working in the nature education sector, sharing his passion and knowledge with young children and youth for close to 30 years uh, in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And today we are very excited to have Sik Chuan with us. Sik Chuan is also the co-writer of a book called uh, Singapore Waters, Unveiling Our Seas, published by the Nature Society of Singapore. And he also guides at the Sister Island Marine Park, amongst many other nature reserves, sharing what he knows and loves best. So without much further ado, I'll hand the time over to Sik Chuan as well as the young experts for today. Okay. All right. So hi, guys. Um, as you know, we're going to be talking about starfish and sea stars. Now, um, technically, these particular animals are now known as sea stars, although a lot of people still call them starfish. All right. Uh, and they've been around our planet for a long time. So has any, have any of you any idea how long um, sea stars and their uh, sort of like family have been on our planet? Any ideas? Evans? A few hundred million years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next slide, please. So records have shown that uh, starfish and uh, well, sea stars and uh, their relatives have been on our planet, on planet Earth, um, for as long as 540 million years ago. And um, some of the earliest uh, types include what you see here. So they've already had that shape. And then on the right-hand side of that slide, you can see a particular relative of uh, sea stars uh, called feather stars, and they are growing on stalks. And we still have that today on Earth, uh, but they live in the very, very deep sea, all right? So next slide, please. All right, now, everybody knows, everybody uh, calls these things starfish. Are they actually fish? All right, uh, Shavon? No. Starfishes are not fish. They belong to a class called Asteroidea. Absolutely. Now, um, do they have backbones? Um, Auntie, is it? Yeah. No, they don't. They have, they also do not have blood. Yeah, so what do you call animals that don't have backbones? Evans. Invertebrates. Okay, good, good, good. So as human beings, 
what are we? Are we invertebrates or are we something else? And um, Ingla. Um, we are mammals. Yep, and mammals, do we have backbones? Yep. Yeah, so we are uh, in we are vertebrates, right? Okay, uh, moving on. Next slide, please. Okay, um, now you said earlier that uh, star sea stars belong to a, a group called Asteroidea, um, but they also share um, sort of characteristics with a larger group called the Echinoderms. Now, has anybody any idea what Echinoderms are? No? Siobhan? Um, All right, echinoderms is basically a very large group of animals, which includes sea stars and some of their other relatives. And uh, it comes from ancient Greek, meaning spiny skin, or more literally, hedgehog skin. You guys know what a hedgehog is? They're cute. Um, so these are animals that have spiny skins, all right? Um, okay, uh, Lester, can you just click one more? And one more time. Yeah, so if you look at these pictures coming up, you can see uh, the skin is quite rough. It's not smooth or it's not like our skin. And uh, some, some of the skin can be so spiny that uh, they come out in long spikes like sea urchins, all right? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for sea stars, they have something called radial symmetry. Uh, do you guys, all right, what is, what do you guys understand radial symmetry? How, how do you understand what radial symmetry is? Um, Unti. Uh, it's symmetrical from all of their tentacles. Their design is symmetrical. Yeah. So radial symmetry means they look a bit like a star. And if you look at the pictures in this, you can see obviously uh, on the right-hand side, it is a five, uh, five-armed star. And if you look in the center, which is a sand dollar, you can see the star shape in the center, yeah? All right, human beings have a different kind of symmetry. We are what is known as bilaterally symmetrical, which means that if you draw an imaginary line down our center, our left side is symmetrical to our right side. So it's locked, sort of like a mirror image. All right, guys, does it make sense? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Now, these particular animals, um, because they don't have a backbone or they don't have any bones, so they need to be able to hold their body shape in a particular way. Um, how, how do they maintain their body shape? Ingla, do you have any idea? Evans? Is it because uh, they have like a skeleton? No, they don't have a skeleton. Uh, they are invertebrates, so they don't have an inside skeleton. Uh, Auntie? Is it because when they transfer their blood, they have a tube like uh, thing so their blood can go through at the same time it acts kind of like a bone you're getting very close to that uh ingla they don't have blood but they regenerate yeah all right so you're all getting very close in order to for them to maintain their body shape they have what is known as a water vascular system. So it's sort of like our blood, but instead of using blood, they use water. They have this special uh, pore 
which comes by a very big name of madreporite, where water goes in and out. And when they pump the water in, it maintains its body shape, okay? So it's like when you fill a balloon with water, it becomes round, all right? And if you let the water out, it becomes soft and mushy, it becomes floppy. That's basically what a, a sea star and even sea cucumbers are, all right? So basically it uses, its, uh, it uses water and water pressure to maintain its body. So what happens if a sea star is taken out of the water? Uh, and she? They act like a floppy balloon. Yeah. Uh, Siobhan, anything to add? It will dry up and die. It will dry up and die. All right. So uh, that's a problem. Uh, these particular animals need to live in water. So if you ever go on a seashore walk, try not to lift the animals out of the water. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how do they move? Evans. They walk using their uh, tube feet. Okay, good. Anchi, can you tell me how their tube feet works? So it acts like our feet, but this time it's smaller. So they have lots of those tiny suction cup feet. So one by one, they will grab onto the ground and start working together to let the starfish move very slowly. Yeah, absolutely. But quick question for all of you. Do starfish move slowly or can they move quickly? Um, Inglet, you had your hand up first. Some, um, some of them is quickly, some of them are slow. Yeah, so moving quickly or slowly is all relative, okay? So if you compare a sea star with us, then yeah, it doesn't move that quickly. But if you compare it with other sea stars, it can move quite quickly. And if you were to go to the seashore and you watch a sea star move around, they are reasonably quick, all right? So all of you got the correct answer. Um, they have what are tiny little suction cups on the end of their feet. And remember how I said they use uh, water pressure to go through their bodies? The water pressure also helps to activate their suction feet. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, do sea stars have eyes? Uh, Siobhan. Yes, they have eyes, it's on top of them. On top of them where? On their skin, in the middle. So, well, not quite, aren't she? They have eyes on each of their tentacles and, and in, their, in the center of the disc. Yeah, okay. So uh, question, are these eyes like our eyes? Evans? No, they are not like, they do not work like our eyes. They are not like our eyes. Okay. Um, Ingla? Uh, um, their eyes is like a sensor. Yeah, yeah. Anything to add, Anchi? Thank you. Okay. So basically, you're all correct. Um, they have eye spots at the end, at the tip of each of their arms here. By the way, these are not tentacles. These are arms. Um, and then um, they have two feet underneath. So at the tip of each of their arms, and some of the other sensor cells are across the top of the body, are basically like what you said, their sensors. They can sense light and dark. And they can use these sensors to sense uh, potential food and potential danger as well, okay? Um, next slide, please. Okay, not yet, not yet. All right, um, okay. How do sea stars eat? Uh, 
All right. Uh, both Anshi and Shavon had your hands up. So, uh, Shavon? Shavon, you're not, you're still muted. They digest their prey outside of their bodies by extruding their stomach out through their mouth and enveloping their meal. Once they digested their food, they will bring their stomach back in through their mouth again. <laughs> okay. Anchi, did you have anything to add? No, thank you. All right. So that was good. Uh, Lester, yeah, can you click? So this, um, this GIF, um, this GIF rather, shows you the stomach coming out, basically. And um, the prey item, their food right now is that uh, clamshell right there. Okay, so they have no teeth, so they can't chew things. So the way they do it is exactly like what Siobhan said. Um, they basically uh, send their stomach out and digest externally uh, before bringing all the nutrients back into themselves, all right? So if you were, if you guys were to invite a sea star to dinner, um, how would you cater to its food? Ingla? Uh, oysters, clams. Uh... Oysters, clams, and all right, Auntie. Yeah. Oysters, clams, Snails. and barnacles. Yeah, Evans, anything to add? Snails. Snails, clams, oysters, mussels, barnacles, yeah. sea anemones, and other sea stars. Oh, okay. Uh, Shavon? Shrimp like crustaceans, clams, yeah. oysters. Yeah. So, would they need uh, forks and spoons? No. No. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Now, reproduction. All right. Um, how they sort of uh, make little babies. How do you think they make little babies? Let's do the next slide. Uh, Anchi? Sometimes they don't actually reproduce. They actually sometimes they actually regrow arms. So they technically they have no arms. Then after that they regrow their arms. So they look like a little sister again. Yeah, uh, Shavon. They they can produce both sexually and asexually. If they produce asexually, they can like break in half or break into smaller pieces. Mm, yeah. All right. So, uh, do you do you know do you understand what sexual reproduction is, and what asexual reproduction is? Okay. Show me your hands. Who understands um, the difference between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction? Show me your hands. Okay, Shavon. Okay, and she kind of gets it. Uh, Evans, do you know the difference? And in, um, England, you, you know, right, England? Okay, good. So um, the difference between uh, these two types of reproduction is that asexual reproduction means that they, they, they don't need a male or female. It's actually uh, what Anchi said uh, previously. They can actually um, separate their body parts and then regrow. So that's asexual reproduction. It also comes under regeneration. All right. Sexual reproduction means you need a male and a female. Most of the time, um, starfish, uh, sea stars, uh, reproduce sexually, but there will be times where they do it asexually. Okay. Uh, next click, please. So this image shows sexual reproduction. There is a male and a female. Uh, and um, some sea stars, they uh, basically climb on top of each other and fertilize like that. Uh, the fertilization is external. So the reason they're close is because the female will release eggs and the male will release their sperm and they'll mix in the water. 
Uh, next clip. And this is um, part of asexual reproduction. All right. Now, certain sea stars are able to basically uh, clone themselves. And what happens is that um, one of these arms, like this big arm right here, is able to separate from the main body. And then that arm sort of walks away. And while the rest of the body stays still, and that body will grow a new arm, while the arm itself will start to uh, regrow a whole new body. Now, since most of the sea stars have all the uh, vital organs contained within the arm, as well as the central disc, uh, as long as there's part of the central disc there, the sea star is able to regrow itself. All right? Does that make sense to you guys? All right, um, so the next slide is one of the superpowers and it's called regeneration. So all of you already have talked about regeneration and how it's very special, okay? Uh, one more click, uh, please. So if the sea star loses part of its body or part of its arm, it's able to regrow. Now, why would a sea star lose its arm? Um, hang on. Uh, Ingler had his, ha had his hands up. Ingler, yes, you wanted to say? They, they have a um, spiky tongue on the uh, back and front. Okay, uh, Anchi, you wanted to add? Uh, they got eaten by the predator and they were trying to escape. Yeah. So, it's a way of uh, saving itself. It's it, capable of losing part of its arm or part of its body. And then uh, the predator will be busy eating that while the sea stars escape. Okay, regeneration. That's a very special power. And uh, what other types of animals in the world do you think can regenerate? What other animals can regenerate too? Um, no. Frogs. Some frogs can do that, yeah. In Singapore, there's an animal that lives in everybody's house that can do that, Siobhan. Lizard. Lizard, in particular, the geckos. What do the geckos do? They shed their tails. That it can distract us to run away. Yeah, they can do that. And uh, some of the other amphibians, uh, like salamanders, can regenerate parts as well. All right. So regeneration um, tends to be limited to the slightly, what we humans call the lower animals, the more primitive animals. Um, but uh, because of that regeneration, uh, a lot of uh, sort of medical uh, researchers are trying to figure out what are the special cells that can do that in hopes that they can apply some of the, uh, the ways to human beings so that we can uh, regenerate more like skin cells and stuff like that. Uh, now, what about sea stars that are dangerous? What sea stars can be dangerous to human beings? Ingler. No. No? Summer. Okay, there is um, one kind of sea star that can be quite dangerous <coughs> to us, but not um, not because it can attack us. Uh, next slide, please. Well, one more click. All right. How many of you have seen pictures of this one before? Okay. Do you know what this particular sea star is called? Siobhan. Is it the crown of thorn starfish? Yes. Um, uh, let's do one click, please. Yes. So I put this as danger sea star because it is the crown of thorns. It's a danger in many different ways. Um, now, what? how is this bad to human beings? 
and see. The thorns are exceptionally sharp and long, so when you touch it, it's almost like you touching your sea urchins or hedgehog. Hence the name, yeah. their group name. Yeah, Ingler? The thorns are poisonous. Yeah, okay. Now, um, very quickly, there's a difference between, okay, um, there's poisonous, and then there's another word called venomous. And the difference is that poisonous is something that you eat and it poisons you, whereas venomous is something if you touch it, like the crown of thorns, the spines, and then it puts venom into you, okay? So, for example, a wasp is venomous because it can sting you. Uh, but if you eat the wasp, it doesn't necessarily poison you. All right, does that make sense? So crown of thorns is considered venomous uh, because the spines are sharp, like Unchi said, and they are venomous, like what English said. And they contain a chemical, a, a toxin in there that if it goes into your skin, will cause a lot of pain, all right? But in what other way can crown of thorns be dangerous but not to us now, but to another different uh, creature. I can see. Um, one of the dangers is that they actually eat the living coral in the coral sea bed. So they are actually eating coral instead of the dead ones, which is actually harming the coral sea beds. Yeah. So this is one of the important things, especially in uh, tropical regions. As and um, what is known as the Coral Triangle in Southeast Asia. Uh, crown of Thorns eat coral and they leave behind lots and lots of dead coral. So that's a bad thing. Now, one of the predators of the Crown of Thorns is a big shell called the Triton Trumpet Shell. Unfortunately, people collect that shell because they look so pretty, which means that the predator is being taken away. And the main uh, challenge is once you remove a predator from nature, the balance of nature is thrown out of whack. And that means that the population of the crown of thorns start to get bigger and bigger. All right, so that's where we have a big problem right now. Um, and this is something that human beings have done to nature. Okay, um, now if we have questions comes later. All right, uh, for Singapore, about how many types of species of sea stars, how many different types of sea stars can be found in Singapore? Shafon. There are at least 31 species of sea stars found in Singapore. They can be found at Chek Jara, Siren Reef, and mm -hmm. Changi Beach. Excellent, well done. All right, so the next few slides, the next few pictures are a few of the different types of sea stars that can be found in Singapore waters. All right, Lester, do you want to run through slowly? Okay, this is a knobby sea star. This is quite common in the northern part of Singapore. So places like Chek Jawa, it can also be found in Cyrene reefs. All right, they are one of the uh, bigger sea stars and uh, they're quite pretty. All right, next click. Wow. Okay, this is a cousin. Next one. Some of them are quite small, like these ones. This is a crown sea star, which resembles the next two. Next click. All right, this is a cake. Okay, so they look a little bit alike. All right, next click, please. And the next click. Uh, this is one that can be found on seagrass beds. Now, not all sea stars have five arms. Some of them have more than five arms. This particular one has eight arms. Next click. This one I like. Uh, this one is called a cushion star and it does look like a big cushion. So the arms have become so short that they become almost part of the main body, all right? Next click. Uh, and next one. Okay. Um, moving on. OK, 
Okay, the next few slides. Uh, the next few slides show some of the cousins of the sea star. Uh, and they look like starfish as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, Ingla, can you, do you think you know what this one is? Ingla. I wanted to tell you a different thing. Okay. Share with us. Um, but um, some sea stars has five to 50 arms. Say again, Ingla. Some, some sea stars as five to 50 arms. Correct, correct. All right, so um, these next few slides. So this one is called a brittle star. Um, it has mainly five arms. And then um, they're called brittle stars because they are quite fragile, right? Uh, next click. Um, this particular one is called a feather star. And uh, this ones can be found, uh, they usually live underwater, all right? This one is, was found on the wetter part of the seashore. And they're called feather stars because uh, their arms look a bit feathery. And then the next one. Okay, this one is a very special one has this particular type is called a basket star because when it folds its arms up, it looks a bit like a basket. Okay. All right. So um, for you guys, uh, how many of you have been on a seashore walk? Most of you, Evans, have you been on a seashore walk before? No. Would you like to? Yeah, seashore walks are very uh, interesting. Um, now, all of these animals can be found along the seashore. Uh, some, some of the seashores, you'll mainly find uh, things like the common sea star. Um, uh, Lester, can you do the last slide? Okay, uh, next slide. All right, so all of these animals can be found on our seashores um, and they are quite special animals, all right? So uh, they can be quite fragile and um, they basically, uh, if you want to hold them, basically you have to be really, very careful. The whole idea is try not to pick up these things because if you lift it out of water, that means it can actually suck air into itself, which causes it to die, all right? So, if you see these things, just leave it in the water, all right? Uh, England. Uh, well, even one single gentle poke, it will also die. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, we're basically at the end of this. Um, do you guys, would you like to share any more things? Uh, what would you like to share about uh, sea stars, Inchi? Uh, I have mine about sunflower sea stars. Yeah. Um, they are one of the most interesting to me as it can have more arms than normal sea stars, having up to 24 limbs. They are one of the largest, fastest, and heaviest sea stars weighing up to 13.4 pounds and moving up to 9.8 feet per minute. And where are these ones found? Coral, most likely coral sea beds, coral reefs. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, Evans? Uh, sea stars cannot survive in fresh water. You're right, sea stars <laughs> cannot survive. In they fresh water. I've been salt water. Yeah. Uh, Siobhan? On average, the sea stars can live up to 35 years in the wild. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about, um, well, this is general for most sea stars, so up to 35 years. 
uh, and sometimes they can survive a bit longer. Yeah, correct. Uh, Ingrid. There are about 2,000 species of sea stars. In the world? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Siobhan? Sea stars are considered a keystone species. A keystone species preys on animals that have no other natural predators and if they are removed from the environment, their prey will increase in number and may drive out other species. Yeah, uh, okay, last two. So Evans, you had your hand up first. Sea star babies are invisible to the naked eye. <laughs> yes, they are very, very small. Sea stars. Okay, and she? Sometimes if you the sea star stop hunting, some let's say for the ox sea star, the the muscles that usually are found in herds will start to have more and more, driving out lots and lots of other wildlife from their ha natural habitats. Yeah. Um, actually, Unchi brought up a very important point, and this is about the balance of nature. And um, we, we're going to have to close this session very soon. But um, whenever we human beings uh, go and mess around with nature, um, we tend to throw the balance of nature very off uh, whack. And it tends to make one more uh, species um, have a big population. Uh, so then it affects the whole ecosystem, all right? So whenever we mess around with nature, generally we don't have very good effect on nature. All right, um, I think this has been a fairly good, uh, uh, this has been a fairly good uh, presentation. Uh, we need to get question and answers now from uh, other people. So thank you all, thank you Evans. Um, and she, Ingla, and Siobhan. Okay, I think we're request ready for Q&A. Um, I, thanks, uh, Sik Chuan and the, the five, four experts. I think we do have some questions. I see one of them here. Um, will the sea stars feel pain when the arms are lost? They, well, it depends on how the arms are lost. Um, and it, the, the whole issue about pain is subjective because I'm pretty sure that the uh, sea stars will feel something but their perception of pain is different from what we uh, perceive uh, as pain as human beings. So um, I'm going to say they don't feel pain in the same way we do. And if the sea stars, um, if they're uh, doing what we call the asexual reproduction where one arm walks off from the other, there's no pain involved in that. I see. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have another question. How long do sea stars and starfish live? Uh, we had that answer from um, Evans, I think it was. Evans, you had your hand up. Uh, they live for, on average, 35 years. Yeah, so on average, 35 years. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think Ingla has a question. It, it is also 10 years some sea star live. Yeah, so up to 35 years. Okay. And, um, someone asks, um, are sea stars edible? <laughs> uh, I was coming to that. Uh, are sea stars edible? <laughs> There's a lot of stories flying around. Um, generally, sea stars are not edible by human beings. Um, one of its cousins is edible, and we see it in seafood restaurants, and that's sea cucumbers. Having said that, there are stories around that say that sea stars are edible. 
Although I've never ever seen anybody eating sea stars. Hansi? It's because uh, most of the sea stars, they produce uh, some bitter tasting or um, not nice tasting particles in their skin. So making it when you eat it tastes not that nice compared to other seafood. Good, good. Uh, Shu Ying, do we have time for one last question? Or is that I think we can have one last question. Uh, so someone is asking, who is the, uh, the natural predator of sea stars? Okay, um, there are many. Uh, most of the time, sea stars, uh, they are quite bad tasting, so predators don't go after them. Um, in the case of the crown of thorns, um, they are eaten by the triton trumpet shell, which is a big, big sea snail. Um, and they are also nibbled, well, well nibbled. They're, um, they're, researchers have seen uh, trigger fish and puffer fish taking bites out of them. Um, trigger fish are known to sort of have a go at most sea stars. Uh, but on the whole, uh, since they're that bad tasting, there are no real predators of sea stars. There are parasites. Uh, some of the uh, sea stars have uh, parasitic animals growing on them, like small snails. Um, there's a particular kind of a crustacean, uh, sort of like a very, very weird looking shrimp inside them. All right, but um, on the whole, in terms of predators, they have very few. Okay. Okay, I think that's all for the Q and A. Um, do you have any last words you want to share, um, uh, Chuan or any of the panelists before I close up? Shabon has something. Question. You may have one thing. Hello. Question now. I think Siobhan and Unchi have something to share. And save the sea stars so that our generation and the next generation can enjoy them. Uh, Unchi? I have a little question. When they take their stomach out, how, how do they actually remove their stomach from their body? without harming it? Well, they don't remove their stomach. They just um, send it out and then they can take it back again. So they don't remove their stomach. So there's like something attached to the stomach? Their stomach remains attached to their body at all times. Okay, yeah. okay I think um, just one last thing, uh, and this is about um, conservation protection. So. Whenever we go out to the seashore um, and we walk along the seashore, especially at low tide, uh, we have to be very, very careful about what we're doing. And, um, and in particular, how we handle the seashore. So um, because we're human beings and we're very curious, we tend to like to pick things up. And for a lot of marine creatures, which rely on water to uh, basically sustain themselves, picking up an animal from their uh, seashore environment and their wet environment is quite harmful to them. And so for general purposes, um, especially when we all uh, walking on the seashore, try not to touch anything. And there's two main reasons. Firstly, is because we may be doing harm to the animal and secondly, the animal could be dangerous to us, all right? So uh, for everybody, if we go on a seashore walk, watch where you put your feet. Sometimes there may be things in the sand like sand dollars, which are very fragile. Uh, secondly, try not to pick things up because you may be doing quite a bit of harm to them. All right, I think uh, that should conclude what we have to do today. Shui 
Okay, thank you so much, Sik Chuan, and thank you for the very important message at the end as well. Uh, and once again, thank you, Sik Chuan, Siobhan, NT, even Evans, and Ingla for sharing all your knowledge. I think I learned a lot about sea stars myself. I learned that they can pump water into their bodies to maintain their body shape. And I learned about the, the, the stomach, them being able to take their stomach outside their bodies. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm sure our audience learned a lot as well. Uh, so if you enjoyed this session today, we hope that you will continue to support the Nature Society. Um, and in general, this is some of the things that Nature Society does. So nature, nature conservation and education outreach to the public. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Nature Society is an NGO and it's mostly run by volunteers. So people like myself, we are volunteers, Lisa, and a, a group of other people organizing these whole sessions today and tomorrow. So if you feel inclined to support our work, we invite you to join us as members. I also welcome donations of any amount. Next slide, please. Yep. So you can help us by uh, funding our environmental programs or you know, support us uh, and joining us in holding our events and advocating for nature. And lastly, you can find out more about our, our activities and news on the social media. So these are our social media links and our website. So if you want, you can take a screenshot and, and visit the site. And then when, of course, when COVID is over and when the restrictions are down, we look forward to meeting you in person again. Okay. So once again, we'd like to express our gratitude and special thanks to our young, young panelists today, uh, Evans, Ingler, Siobhan, Enti, and of course, very importantly, uh, Mr. Chua Sik Chuan for sharing all your knowledge and your expertise today. Uh, we've come to the end of this session on Sea Stars, and on behalf of everyone and the organizing team, uh, I'd like to thank, thank you for joining us. So our next session will be on sea anemone at 3 o'clock, um, and yeah, please join us for then as well. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.